little hut with someone in it. <laughs> but yeah, I, I lived in New York City for a long time, and I fondly remember my green hut with everything, two feet by two feet. The, uh, the, if you don't recognize the guy, he's, he's basically trying to say, listen, it is about the money. And uh, all the stuff that a good offensive security researcher would normally have given away, all the stuff that was essentially uh, free to them, is now so expensive for them to create that they cannot give it away. Which means if you look at Usenix security, it's crap, right? Have, I don't know who's been there, but there's nothing there worth reading. If there's nothing there that scares you, then, I mean, that is the pinnacle of your, like, of your Usenix security research for the year. It's just bad stuff, right? And it's not their fault. The problem is no one's going to submit a great paper to them because no one can afford to, right? And the same thing's true for most academic security organizations. They just can't afford to do it. And it's not just the, uh, the, the vulnerabilities themselves. It, it's not just the, like, here is a stir copy in, you know, Bob's web server stuff, right? It's also, how do I exploit this stuff? What other stuff should I be looking for? What combinations of stuff are exploitable? How does the actual landscape evolve? You've really cut off, once you start taking away the security offensive research, you've cut off entire research avenues, and no one starts looking at that stuff again, which uh, is kind of the problem with the whole scenario from some perspectives. And the reason they're so expensive is not because people are doing a lot of work looking at code and making it more secure, but they're just securing the platforms completely. Right? If you have GR security, which is what my laptop sort of has, uh, you've got, for the past six or seven years, you've had essentially the combination of safe SEH, ASLR, NX, and all the other good stuff, all ACLs on your system calls. And so anyone writing an exploit against that has to do 1,500,000 things to bypass all the protections that were available for six years from a college student named Brad Spengler, who, of course, uh, you know, has given it away for free. And then Microsoft and OpenBSD decided to adopt a lot of the same things. And nowadays, this stuff is on almost everybody's machine. If, you have, if you're running Windows 2003, Windows 2008, Vista, even XP Service Pack 2 has most of it, uh, all this stuff comes into account, and uh, it's making your life real hard. But I've bolded the ones here that actually kind of work. The, uh, the, like, the automated code review programs and the system call ACLs and the process isolation, it's not really affecting us yet. Maybe it will in the future. Uh, and so the reason they're all doing this is they built it all into their stuff when uh, they stopped getting sales, right? When Mi Microsoft turned all around after the big worm, uh, and Linux, of course, has always kind of had it, and they've kind of been more hippie about it. But uh, when they build it into GCC, when it's that free to secure the platform, when people are moving to .NET ASP uh, stuff and all that stuff, that's driving their vendor differentiation. If you go to the Microsoft booth now for SQL 2008 or whatever it is, is that they still in 2008? Right? You're going to see, you're going to get a little leaflet saying, here's what our security is, and here's why it's better than my SQL and Oracle. That's going to be their marketing brochure. And that difference that, they're, that's, that difference that they're investing in it is making everyone else who's doing offensive work having a, a little bit of anxiety. You can feel the anxiety bubbling, right? Um, nevertheless, uh, this is what's making it expensive. Uh, and for most of you, we're in the web space here, you, there were pretty much no talks about buffer overflows in this entire conference. And I think it's very interesting uh, if you saw the NIST uh, thing today that they, they reviewed uh, like three or three uh, C programs and uh, they didn't find any O-Day. They found nothing really worth reporting is, was the result. Uh, and most of you are writing things in Ruby on Rails and J2EE and ASP.NET, uh, even ASP. You're not, you're not finding remote overflows in this stuff. You, overflows, as far as you're concerned, are not a problem. Uh, and eventually people are like, listen, it's managed language. That's what we do. We wanted to solve that problem. Uh, and that's all true. So if most of the people who did offensive security research have been through, at one point, a consulting organization who found vulnerabilities and reported them to vendors. This used to be a very common thing. Uh, but that whole thing that you did was your marketing budget. That's where that money came from. If you were IBM 
X-Force, if you were at stake or if you were found stone reporting vulnerabilities, you weren't getting paid to do that because for whatever reason, the, the vendors were generating sales off that. You were getting paid to do that because it generated press and therefore revenue. It was a marketing gimmick. It came out of your marketing budget, uh, which is a perfectly great way to get marketing at one point in time. And now is uh, completely ineffective for two reasons. One, your bang for the buck is gone because there's thousands of vulnerabilities now, most of them cross-site scripting, which is awesome. And uh, very few of them matter at all. And if you did have a good one, it'd kind of be lost in the wind, right? Like the click jacking thing, everyone, eh, whatever, right? It's kind of, maybe we'll make some news, maybe not. Uh, but even if, you, even if it was pretty valuable to send a bug out to the public and send, give it to the vendor and get it patched, when you write a buffer overflow, it's now so expensive that it, it just can't, that your marketing budget just doesn't have it. You're, there's not like $500,000 in your marketing budget for vulnerability research. It's not there. Uh, and of course, you know, if you want to do vulnerability exploitation, then you must learn a lot about how to do all the different techniques that you're going to need to get there. And each of those techniques is also very expensive because those are just the building blocks of all what you're putting together. So if you're going to do heap overflows on AIX, or whatever, that, that's going to be a very expensive research project that you have to put together and maintain across all the versions and all that. So if you do not know that you can write an exploit, it's very hard for you to know that it is exploitable or not. Because as Gobbles proved with their patchy nose job, even Mark Dowd doesn't always know when his bugs are not exploitable. There's a, there's a certain fact that someone else could always come behind you and say, in fact, I have a working exploit, and here it is. And so you are wrong, and everyone's at risk, and their whole brain breaks, shifting without a clutch. So here's where we are with this. It's a bit of a doomsday presentation, isn't it? I thought it would be funnier. <laughs> It'll get funny later. See, there's doom and then funny. We'll, we'll try it that way. All right, so uh, immunity, we write a lot of buffer overflows. Like our product is based on buffer overflows. We do web stuff. We do everything. But we, we do a lot of buffer overflows. Uh, and what you see is that people, essentially, from the outside, the problem is solved as far as they're concerned. They're like, honestly, there has not been a vulnerability in IS6, which is pretty old now, right? It's like five years old. It's IS6. Uh, if there has never been a working exploit against IS6, then that changes the way you react when you are installing Microsoft products. You think, I'm good. And you're right. And the, if there hasn't been a worm since Slammer, why do you buy expensive IPS systems? Why would you? And maybe this helps explain some of the sort of damper on that market, right? Like, I was buying, everyone wanted an IPS because they were like, hey, well, if the next slammer comes around, I don't want to be the guy without something in front of me to protect me. Right? I can't patch, so I might as well put a rule in. Maybe that'll help me. But if there isn't ever going to be another worm, what if there never was another worm from now on, ever? No network worms. Then why would you ever buy an IPS? Because it's a lot of money, and it can break your whole network, and that hurts you, and your customers complain, and you get fired. It sucks. So, uh, so you start seeing stuff like that. Like, you start seeing the market sort of react to this, not just the, in the sort of a, where do I put my money sense, but also in the, where do I invest my research dollars sense. Because if overflows are not worth researching in, maybe cross-site scripting needs to get some funding. Right? And that's what you see here at OWASP, which is great.